So maybe we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Tara isn't here today, but a reminder that next week is the last session and then there's a Q&A the week afterwards um, that we'll have a Slido up for. Uh, can anybody else think of any notes I'm forgetting? I don't think so. Thank you for covering that. Okay. Yeah, okay. So um, then I guess I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen and we can um, we can get started. All right, so uh, as a reminder, I will be in full screen mode, so I can't see the chat. Um, so if questions pop up in there that uh, need to be answered, then you know feel free to interrupt, uh, interrupt me because I can't see it. Um, but this week we are going to be talking about the subseasonal to seasonal metrics that have been added to uh, Met Plus. Can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive right in. Uh, these are new process-based, some of them are new process-based metrics that uh, are a lot, a lot of them are in MetPlus version 4.1. So if you compare 4.0 to 4.1, you'll see a lot of new use cases in the subseasonal to seasonal uh, area. So last week we talked about MetCalPy and MetPlotPy. And these, uh, those two are very important because they're used in many of the S2S metrics. So this week, the focus is going to be on uh, some of the use cases that I've listed here. So two MJO indices, the RMM and OMI, uh, atmospheric blocking calculation, weather regime analysis, and if there's time, the zonal and meridional means. So I'm not going to discuss all of the S2S use cases because there just isn't time. And so I've listed the ones at the bottom that we won't be talking about down here today. So why do these subseasonal to seasonal metrics deserve their own session in MetPlus? And there's several reasons, but one of them is that they run scripts from multiple repositories. So they call programs from Met, MetCalPy, MetPlotPy, and MetDataDB. So specifically, they include combinations of the following. And that would be pre-processing steps, and these can be done in your Met tools like PCP Combine or Regrid Data Plane, or they can sometimes be done in Python scripts that live in MetCalPy. They also include indices and diagnostics that are calculated in Python from MetCalPy, graphics that come from MetPlotPy, and then statistics that are computed on the output. In this case, the only use cases we have call stat analysis, but you could call another MET program. So they use multiple input files, which would be similar to like series analysis and mode TD. But in this case, some of the use cases use uh, up to 20 to 30 years worth of data. So a lot of files. Also, the indices and diagnostics are computed separately for the model and the observations and then something is done from the output. And uh, finally, they're run using what we call a driver script in MetPlus, uh, calling MetPlus is called with MetPlus's user script command. And I'm going to talk about what those two things are first, and then we'll get into the use cases. So we'll start off with the driver script. So a driver script is a Python script, but it's different from the MetPlus wrappers because it doesn't call met tools it calls specific programs inside multiple repositories so metcalpy metplotpy metdataDB and it can call one or all of those three repositories one or more times and the order in which they're called varies by the use case by, by use case so it's different for the different use cases uh, a driver script is unique to the metrics and plots that you're wanting to make. So if new metrics get added to MetCalPy or MetPlotPy, that would mean updating your driver script so that it calls those programs. 
Some other notes about DriverScript. The repositories used in the DriverScript need to be available in your Python path or Conda. So if you're calling metcalcpy, metplotpy, metdataDB, those all have to be available or your script won't run. And then secondly, the driver script is located in the metplus repository in a use case folder. So the use case folder is basically the use case name minus the .conf on the end. And I'm showing down here a driver script in, in a use case folder. So you can see it's in the use cases area, model applications S2S. And then this is a blocking use case. And there's one file in the folder, which is the blocking driver. So this is a visual of what a driver script does. And so purple, everything in purple would be the driver script. And then green are the repositories that it's, it's calling programs from. So it might take input netcdf data, we'll say met format netcdf. And then it would call metdataDB, which would then return your data as um, an X array. And then that data might be sent into metcalcpy to return a calculated data array, an index or a diagnostic, whatever you're calling. And then finally, that calculated data array might be sent into matplotpy to get a graphic. So the driver script calls the programs and passes data from one to the other. It's really what it does. So uh, we'll move on to a user script. So user script is an option in Metplus. And it generates user-defined commands that are run from a metplus.conf file. So some examples of these is you could do something like unzipping or uh, calling scripts. So why would you want to call, uh, call something that you could run on a command line from a metplus.conf file? And there's several reasons. Uh, the first few would be uh, accessing Metplus's timing controls so that you can loop by valid or initialization times or skipping times. Also access to its file name templates. But what's more important in these use cases is that you can easily link runs of Met with other calculations or plotting in any order. So you can call like that driver script. You can um, you can call metcalcpy, metplotpy, but you can also call your pre-processing and um, also post-processing and stat analysis, all from one configuration script. So here on the right, I'm showing some of the input options for user script. And I'm not going to go through all of them because you can read about them in the help files. But I wanna call out a couple here because they behave a little bit differently than they do in other Metplus programs. So those two would be your, uh, user script input template. Now, in this case, this is a list of input templates for your input files. So it can be a list of any number comma separated. And the uh, user script input directory is appended if it's specified. But what it does in this case is that it saves the files that it finds to an output text file. And then you get missing if a file isn't found. So instead of just having those input templates available to program, here you get an output file, which you can then call from your driver script program. And then the user script input template labels gives a name to the text files. Uh, there are some other words tacked on to the end of the name, but that allows you to specify your your template name. So this has to be in the same order as your input template. So sorry, as your input template. So if you've specified your observation template first, then you would want to put whatever name you want for your observation files here. Otherwise, they'll be in the wrong files. Uh, and then lastly, the user script command is what it sounds like the command that you want to run uh, exactly as it would be typed on a command line. So here's an example of a user script that's run in Metplus. And at the top, I'm showing the process list. So here you can see the user script is third in the process list. And if we look down, here are some of the settings for the user script. So in this case, it's run once per lead time. So the runtime frequency is similar to how it would be run, I, I, I believe, in stat analysis. The input template here, and this is a little bit long because I didn't use input dir, which would have made it 
cleaner, but there's two input templates separated by the comma. The first one is ERA, which is our observations, and the second is GFS, which is our model. And so I've labeled these down here as OBS input and forecast input. And then the command at the bottom is just calling this particular driver script, which will run a Python script. So um, another thing to note here is that there isn't a lot of timing information that I'm showing here. In this case, uh, only the lead sequence. And for this particular file, the timing information is given up higher in a different configuration section. And so that brings me to the next point we need to talk about, which are configuration sections. And I believe you've touched on these briefly, but I'm going to give a little bit more detail here. So configuration sections are sections in your configuration file, and they're labeled in brackets. So over here is a case of these two. Uh, there's a daily mean ob section and a running mean ob section. The sections are referenced in your process list by parentheses after the tool name you want to call. So for daily mean obs, we're calling PCP combine. For the running mean obs here, we're also calling PCP combine. So why would you want these? Well, they're needed if you want to run a tool multiple times with different settings. And the classic case would be PCP combine if you wanted to run it with like a mean and a subtract. In that case, you would have two different obs PCP combine methods. And so you would need some way to tell net plus which one you want to run for whichever program you're calling. So this isn't the best example because in this case, both of these methods are calling uh, a mean, but uh, it's a case where PCP combine is being called twice. Now, a couple of other notes, you can still put common variables in your config section at the top, but each one of these runs will use variables in the only in the config and whatever section you're running. So if there's duplicate variables in your new section, they overwrite config. Uh, another point is that variables in a specific section are not available to other sections. It's only config and the section that you're running that you get variables from. So if you do like I did and try to reference something in another section, it won't work. Um, so some other considerations for user script and driver script. So input variables can be put in the user environment variables section of a configuration file. Now, these input variables are specific to the driver script that you're running. So unlike MET plus where there's common naming conventions such as, you know, OBS and then the tool grid stat and then say var one name, that doesn't exist for the driver scripts. You get the variables that are specific for whatever you're running. Uh, additionally, plotting variables in some of the use cases are specified in the user environment variable section. And in other use cases, they're specified in YAML files. So it depends on which use cases you're running. Um, secondly, as I showed on the previous slide, input file name templates don't go in the user script section. They go in the, or I'm sorry, don't go in the user environment variables section. They go in the user script section. So your input variables would be anything other than those file name templates. Um, uh, also, different use cases have different Python dependencies, and so you'll need to check the use case documentation to, uh, to see what, what is needed for the use case you're running. And then lastly, uh, input data. So MetDataDB reads NetCDF using the readfile.py. Most of, or all of the use cases that are input here, I believe, uh, run off of Met format NetCDF because there was pre-processing done. But right now, if you're trying to input another format into these driver scripts, you'll need to do some pre-processing to get it into Met format NetCDF first. All right, so let's go ahead and start talking about some of the use cases. So the first one and the simplest is the OMI, uh, OLR-based MJO index use case. And there's actually two of these, one that runs a forecast and an observation and one that just runs an observation. And it calls the OMI driver.py. So input to this use case would be your outgoing long wave radiation and then EOFs one and two. In this case, the only format that's 
uh, accepted for the EOFs is a text file from PSL, um, one file for each day of the year. There are two optional pre-processing steps, and I have in parentheses here turned off. The pre-processing, this will apply to all the use cases, the pre-processing for these use cases are turned off because they took too long for our automated tests. But the settings are left in the configuration file so that you can see how to run them if you needed to do that pre-processing on your own data. And the two steps are uh, PCP combine to create daily mean data and then regrid data plane, which cut the domain down to negative 20 to 20 in latitude. Uh, as a side note, these pre-processing steps are run on the model and the observation. So I'm saying two steps, but if you're running both of these steps for the model and the observation, then you end up with four steps. So there's one calculation, which is the OI index that lives in the MetCalcPy area, and uh, one output plot, which is the phase diagram that I'm showing here uh, on the right. And the output plots, again, are separate for the model and observation. So if you're running both, you would get two. So a little bit more information about the OMI use case. Um, the calculation specifically includes a projection of the 20 to 96 days filtered OLR onto the daily spatial EOF patterns. And some configuration options that I'm showing here to the right are whether you want to run forecast or OBS. Those are just true or false. Uh, whether in this case we're running the observation and not the forecast. Uh, the number of observations per day, we did a daily mean, so that would be one. And then down here are some plotting specific variables. So plot output directory and our plot time begin and end. Uh, and then also some output plot names. And then down at the bottom are our input templates and labels and directories here in the user script section, not in the user environment variables section. So that's how you would set up OMI. So the next one is uh, the RMM use case. There is one use case which calls the RMM driver. And it takes uh, outgoing long wave radiation, 850 millibar wind, and 200 millibar wind. And also EOFs 1 and 2 for those three variables. In this case, the only input that we have configured is to have uh, text files from uh, the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. There's four optional pre-processing steps. So two for PCP combined, which create a mean daily annual cycle and daily means, and then regrid data plane, which cuts our domain down. And then thirdly, uh, computing anomalies. This is a harmonic analysis, which is available in MetCalcPy. So you would have to call that with a user script. Uh, option. There's one calculation, the RMM, and then you get three output plots. So a time series plot, EOFs, uh, which I'm showing here. So the top would be your principal component one and two time series for the RMM. The bottom is showing the EOFs plot. And then the phase diagram, which looks very much like the phase diagram does for the OMI case. And so here again, you get separate plots for your model and observation. So if you were running both of them, then you would end up with six. Um, I'm not gonna go through what all of the calculation includes here, but uh, there are more configuration options in this case. So like the OMI, there are options to run the observations or run the forecast, but there, and, and also the uh, OBS for day, but there are also additional variables, in this case, variable names for your three OLR 850-200, the uh, text file, the uh, EOF text files. In this case, they're not in the, they're not in the input templates because there's only one file. So there's, there was no template to, to uh, format to um, find. Uh, normalization factors for the RMM, and then your plotting specific variables, in this case for the three plots, your EOFs, your phase plots, and your time series plots. And much like uh, OMI, your input templates and directories are in the user script section, which I'm not showing here because I ran out of room. All right, so now onward to the more complicated use cases. 
Uh, the first one is atmospheric blocking, which calls the blocking driver. Uh, this use case takes daily mean and anomaly 500 millibar height, preferably a 20 to 30 year data set if you have it. There are four pre-processing steps. So the first one is regrid data plane, which will regrid your data to one degree. And then the next three are all PCP combined calls. So the first one to create either a daily mean or a forecast lead mean. The second one to create a running mean, I believe the five day running mean. And then the third would be PCP combined subtraction to compute anomalies. Within the blocking calculation in MetCalpply, there are four calculation steps. So the CBL or central blocking latitude, IBLs or instantaneously blocked longitudes, group IBLs, and then your blocking frequency. In this case, the steps have to be run in order. So if you want to run IBLs, you have to first run the CBL step. If you try to skip steps, you'll get an error. Um, the IBLs and blocks are also written to METS matched pair format if both a forecast and observation are run out of this step. There are three optional plots. So your CBLs your I and your blocking frequency. And um, last step, there are two calls to stat analysis if both your model and observations are run. And you get contingency table statistics for the IBLs and the blocks. So some additional notes about the blocking. Um, the pre-processing and stat analysis steps are specified in your process list like they are for other MET plus configurations, but the calculations and plotting steps are specified in the user environment variables section. And they're specified, uh, as I'm showing here, for your observation and your forecast with a plus sign between them. So this would be an example where we're running all the steps for both the forecast and the observations. So you can see the CBL and then that would be the plot. Um, it's you know, self-explanatory. Uh, some additional output notes. Uh, the CBLs and blocks are plotted separately for the model and observations, but IBLs end up on the same plot if you're running both of them. So let's talk about these four steps. So the CBL is calculation of the central blocking latitude. And in this case, it can use uh, the observation climatology for the model with this setting called use CBL OBS equals true. So if you only have a few years of a model, but you want to run the CBL climatology on your observations, you can do that. Some required input is your 500 millibar anomaly files. And then these two kind of strange variables I'm listing here number of seasons and days per season. And so uh, what's with these? Well, the input code requires the same number of days in each year. So if you're running December, January, February for 10 years, you have to have December, January, February for all 10 years. Um, so you can't do a partial year. Now, because the file input templates will fill missing, you can actually do a partial year, but you would need to adjust your start and your end times to reflect those full years, otherwise you'll get an error. So it's an unfortunate limitation of the code. Um, some optional input here is your smoothing points and the output that you get is this plot, which shows the central blocking latitude can be thought of as the storm track in black. Hey, Tina, yes. there's, a, there's a question in the chat. Um, okay. You want me to read it or do you, can you pull that up? Um, not i can't get to it easily okay I, i'll go ahead and read it it says is there is any of these seasonal analyses involve creating climatology of variables in pre-processing step how is that done using met for large data sets so i'm not sure what they mean by climatology of variables um uh, uh christina uh, yeah yeah, I put that question. And uh, so in UFS at EMC, we do a lot of prototype testing of the uh, uh, subseasonal model. So we run a huge uh, like uh, data set like that involves uh, seven years of initial conditions and that run the model for 45 days and try to make a climatology out of that. So I'm just wondering how that can be done in MET 
for involving large data sets that involve like multiple variables to have a climatology or smooth climatology or something like that. I, 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 yeah, I guess I'm still not understanding what you're meaning by climatology. Is it means of some kind? Is it something yes, else? It's, yeah, it's a mean or, uh, yes, it's a mean and then we can do an anomaly and all those things. Yeah, so that can all be done in uh, Met Plus's PCP combine. You just have to specify the time period. You can do an annual mean, um, and there's examples of that in the RM or in the RMM um, in the RMM script. Um, I don't have time to cover that totally today, but um, you know the drawback is that you get a lot of output files when you do means in PCP combine, but you can do an annual mean, a daily mean, and those would all be pre-processing in PCP combine. Okay, so got I, it. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, next step is the uh, IBL step, and this computes um, IBLs using the Pelly Hoskins method which looks for reversals in the geopotential height gradient and easterly flow equator word of a block. So it uses 500 millibar height files and then those same two number of seasons and days per season. And some optional input is that you can do an offset from the uh, central blocking latitude. The default is um, five grid points in either direction, this 505 array. And the output you get uh, shown here from the plotting. So this is uh, IBLs with uh, plotted, I believe, with long, longitude. Um, yeah, longitude. And these are averaged over the whole data set, which is why they're so smooth and so close. And then the last two steps um, are GIBLs groups IBLs by applying spatial thresh thresholds. So these are thresholds to just make groups. And some optional input is to specify um, say the number of grid points in an IBL to make a, a group, which would be 15. Um, the space, if you want to group everything in between as a GIBL, you can specify that distance. Uh, and then lastly, the blocking step applies spatial and temporal thresholds to the GIBLs to ensure that a block persists and is quasi-stationary. So a time requirement for how, how long your blocking has to last, a maximum distance it can travel. Um, and an overlap in grid points, uh, which helps uh, apply those spatial and temporal thresholds. And the output you get looks very much like the previous plot. Uh, in this case, it's showing the IBLs, the GIBLs, and the blocked events. And this is averaged over all of our years with longitude. All right, so last use case um, would be the weather regime analysis. Uh, in this Sorry, case, no. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt, but um, this is probably a good place to at, at, to respond to Jack Jack at Noah. He had a uh, link to um, he had a question. Is this a good current reference to the example you are showing? So I'm thinking that this is the S2S blocking. Um, he's pointing to the Met Plus use case for section five two eight seven, and and I think that's just the portion that generates the data, and it's not the plots. Um, that should actually include the plots. Um, so it says regrid data plane PCP combine and blocking Python code. Um, I think it actually, yeah, it does. So this one includes the, um, the plots as well. So yes, that's a good reference for the blocking use case. Maybe we need to change the title to make it more clear. So, so let us know, Jack, if that answered your question. Yeah, it does. I was just making sure I had the right link. Thanks. Yep, you do. All right. So yeah, so last use case, uh, weather regime, which takes daily mean 500 millibar height, uh, two pre-processing steps in this case, regridding to one degree and then PCP combine to create your daily mean or your forecast lead mean. Um, there are four calculation steps. You can, unlike the blocking, you can run any of these except frequency. So the four steps are the first one, which is called elbow, which creates optimal uh, an optimal number of clusters, uh, computing EOFs, and then K-means is the step that creates your weather regimes. 
and then frequency does a time frequency of the weather regimes. So you can run, in this case, k-means without first running L, running EOF, but you can't run the frequency without running k-means because you need the clusters for the frequency. Uh, in this case, the weather regime classification and frequency are written to MET's meshed pair format if they're both run. There are four optional plots, the uh, elbow, EOFs, k-means, and frequency. Two stat analysis runs if you're running this on both a model and an observation, and you get multi-category contingency table statistics for the weather regime classification and continuous statistics for the weather regime frequency. So like the blocking, the pre-processing and stat analysis here are specified in your process list, and the calculation and plotting steps are specified in the user environment variables section in very much the same way as the blocking. There's just different step names here, which I'm not going to read them off. And then in this case, you get one uh, item of additional output, which is a classification file. So it gives the day or a date and then what regime it was classified in, and it can come out in a text or a net CDF file. So we'll talk about these steps real quick. I'm running low on time. So elbow computes the optimal cluster number by finding the bend in the elbow using a sum of squared distances. So it needs your daily mean 500 millibar files um, and also much like the blocking that number of season and days per season. And optimal uh, optional input is you can specify the number of clusters you want to run this calculation over. So the output plot here, the asterisk, is indicating our optimal number of clusters would be at five. Um, EOFs and k-means. So the EOF step computes EOFs, and it will reconstruct the EOFs um, to use as height input to k-means if you want to do that. So it takes the same input as your elbow, which is your 500 millibar height, number of seasons, days per season, but you can also specify the number of principal components you want to run. And then k-means uses k-means clustering to determine the weather regimes and orders them based on frequency. Uh, it either takes your 500 millibar height, number of seasons, days per season, or if you've run EOFs, it'll uh, take the reconstructed EOFs as your input. So uh, optional input, number of weather regimes, and then also what I'm going to talk about on the next slide is forecast reordering. The default is to use a spatial correlation to reorder, but um, there are other uh, options. So this is an example of the output you get from the weather regime classification. So there's one for the model, one for the observations, and so these are um, patterns. Uh, for the different weather regimes. And so what's with the forecast reordering? Well, I mentioned that these are ordered based on frequency. And so in some cases, what happens is your frequencies don't match between the model and the observation. So here in our model, weather regime one looks similar to weather regime one in the model, but two actually matches weather regime three in the model. And what's three in our observations matches four in the model. So if you want your output statistics to be meaningful, then you have to match up like regime to like regime. So the forecast reordering will do that for you. So now our GFS is no longer in order of frequency, but it's matching our observation frequency so that we can get statistics. And then lastly, the frequency and plot frequency plot uh, uh, options, it computes the frequency of each classified weather regime over a specified time period. And so the only input is the weather regime classification array, and the, uh, the optional input is that you can specify the time period you want to uh, uh, calculate the frequency. The default is seven days. And you get an output which shows the frequency um, over uh, your your week of DJ, uh, December, January, February over time for the different weather regime options. Um, all right, uh, so lastly, I'll do it really fast. We might have time to squeeze it in. Lastly is, uh, this one is a work in progress that's going into MET Plus, but uh, it now has the option to compute zonal and meridional means. In this case, in uh, one of our stratosphere use cases. So it takes in UV temperature, geopotential height as 3D data, and it will calculate um, your zonal mean for uh, U and temperature, and then a meridional mean 
on your um, zonal mean temperature. Um, oops, that looks like it's a leftover from a previous slide. But right now the plotting is separate in Metplotpy, and there's going to be some additions to this use case in the future. But uh, I wanted to call out that we now have the ability to do these zonal and meridional means. So um, with that, we will move on to the hands-on section. It might not actually be hands-on. Uh, are there any questions in the chat that I should address before I do the hands-on section? Yeah, there's one more. It says, looks, looks, I think he means looks like this weather regime is not applicable in the tropics. So it is. Um, you specify where you want to run the weather regime calculation. In this case, the pre processing was done in regrid data plane to cut it down to a grid that's over the United States. And so if you wanted to do it in another area, you would have to regrid your data for that area. Did that answer your question? Oops. All right, I'll, I'll assume that answered the question and we'll move on to starting to run some of these use cases. So uh, I've been told that the, um, the S2S data is not available on the AWS. And I know that MetCalPy, MetPlotPy, and MetDataDB aren't linked into the tutorial on Cheyenne. So uh, you may not be able to follow along with this case. Uh, it may be more of a demonstration because of the data issues, but I still think it will be instructive to run them. So we're going to start off with the uh, OMI use case because it's the simplest. And so our OMI use case is located, whoops, no, build base, and PARM use cases, model applications. S2S, and it's, we're going to run the OBS only OMI use case, which is this one. Uh, user script, OBS ERA, OBS only OMI. Um, and so I'm going to open this, let's go to the top. I'm going to open this file because uh, it, it's helpful to look at the configuration file. So I mentioned that all of these pre-processing steps are turned off and that's, uh, that's, identified here with the process list that's commented out. So in this case, uh, it looked like our data came to us as a daily mean, so we just did the regrid re data plane to trim the domain down. But that stuff is commented out. And um, if I go down, uh, went down too far, uh, there's my regrid, regridding options, which are left in this file so that you can see them. All right. So weird thing about this use case is that there's actually two calls to user script. And I said in the presentation that, uh, oh, there's one calculation. So what is the second call to user script? In this case, this first call to user script uh, does exactly what the label suggests and that it creates an EOF file list. So why am I not doing it in the user script uh, in the, the user script that calls OMI. And the reason is because our OMI use case is running from you know, multiple years, 1979 to uh, 2012, but our EOFs, there are only 366 files. So the ERFs are computed over the years, but, uh, and there's one file for each day. So if I were to try to search for these files, using these date ranges, I'm not going to get what I want because there's way too many of them. So in this case, I'm using a separate call to user script to create the, uh, the EOF file names. And where is this call to user script? There it is. Uh, so here's the call to user script. And then my input templates are for my EOF files um, they're labeled with day number. So that's my percent J here. And the command in this case is just saying populated the file list. So it's not actually doing anything other than populating the file list. All right. And so um, lastly, our user script is run in this command. Now, uh, 
we actually have to edit this use case to get it to run because there's some missing data in the data tarball. And so it's not going to work right off the bat. And so I need to send this to a different location. Whoops. Oh, uh, yeah, let's, I can't change read only file. So I'm going to pull this over to my, I'm going to pull this over to my user config section first. And then I can, I should be able to edit it. All right. Let's see. All right, so sending this to a different directory. We're going to change this to say forecast GFS. And then I also need to change this in my, um, my EOF area, which is here. And then last one. All right, and the second thing I'm going to do, this use case takes a while to run. So I'm gonna cut down this time domain so that we are only gonna run it over say two years. Um, otherwise we'll be sitting here waiting for it forever. Um, okay, so now I should be ready to run the use case. Uh, it, here you can see the metcalpy, metplotpy that are in my directory. Um, and it gets run just like any other metplus use case with run metplus.py minus C and then pointing to my user config and my script inside there and then minus C and my tutorial.com file. So hopefully this works and I didn't forget something. Um, yeah, there it goes. So we can see it already did the finding of the EOF files. Oh, Lordy. Uh, that's, that's, uh, all right. Well, let's see what happened. This worked for me yesterday, so I'm not sure what happened. Oh, I bet I know what happened. Um, I didn't, it's probably not finding. Okay, so the ideal way is to run this Anaconda environment. I didn't have time to set one up. So I, I'm just gonna put these in my path. Um, I forgot this. Um, but I forgot to do this earlier. All right. Now let's see if it works. And this use case will still take about, you know, 40 seconds or something, even with the, uh, even with cutting down the domain, but uh, it looks like it's going to go this time. Yay. Um, so when it finishes, we'll take a look at some of the output so that you can see those, those text files that come out uh, from the, the user script options. All right. Um, Cheyenne appears to be going a bit slow today. Um, that's okay. We'll we'll give it a little bit more time, and hopefully, this will finish running. Okay. Well, I'm. Oh, disk quota exceeded. Huh. I filled up my disk. Um. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, looks like I need to move my output base um, if I want to. So, let's just change this to be um, what I got. Anyway. Got in here. We'll call it tutorial output. Okay. output. 
All right, one last try, and if this still doesn't work, we'll just take a look. I, I printed out some of the output from the weather regime use case yesterday in case something happened with the run. I wonder while this is running. Um, Um, I'm gonna get rid of some of these. Hopefully, ah, now now we ran successfully. Okay, so that was the issue. So let's go ahead and go to my tutorial output directory. Um, there's going to be two sets of output here. The weather regime takes uh, quite a long time to run, so I. Uh, I ran it yesterday so that we could take a look at the output. Um, but first, the output files are located in uh, the output text files, which contain listing of your input files, come out in the staging area. And so for uh, OLR, we get three output files, which are EOFs 1 and 2, and then this is our OBS OLR input. And so if I just open one of these up, I'll use less. Uh, this is what it looks like inside. So it's just a listing of the files that are being input to the user script. And it starts with file list at the top. If there's missing data, you'll see missing here. I don't believe there's any missing data in this case. Uh, so there shouldn't be any. So that's what uh, that's what those file file lists look like that come out of the user script templates. And then let's go ahead and go into the S2S area and our OMI. In this case, we should only have a plot because right now that's all the OMI plots. And so there is our plot. And this is going to look differently or different from the one that I showed in the um, in the PowerPoint because I changed the timing, and it does. But it still looks uh, looks like it's something that could be uh, valid. So, um, so there's our OMI use case. And so the next one we can try to run would be our uh, weather regime use case. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up that weather regime use case file, which will be in Metplus uh, build base. Um, Parm use cases, model applications, S2S. Um, and we'll run the weather regime, this one, forecast. This is a forecast and an observation uh, uh, weather regime. So I'm going to go to the top here. Again, you can see uh, the two pre-processing list uh, steps commented out. And we're not going to go through those since we've already talked about regrid data plane and PCP combined. Here, there's only one call to the user script and two calls to stat analysis. Um, this script will output a number of matched pair files. So if you're trying to run it in, and I know you're, you probably can't follow along now, but if you're trying, if you try to run it later in the tutorial directory and you don't have a lot of space, uh, you may exceed your disk quota like I did earlier. Um, and so uh, just be sure to direct that output to somewhere that, uh, that you have enough space for. So I'll go ahead and go down. So here's the user environment variables. And so you can see the forecast steps and the observation steps. They're specified the same way for the blocking um, with those plus signs. Here we have all of them turned on. So the four steps and the four plots. Um, and then our number of seasons and days per season. Here we have uh, input variables. So that's the OBS variable and the forecast variable that are input and then our weather regime cluster number of clusters. You can see I have both of these for the forecast and observations, but I'm setting them to the same. So I'm using uh, the, the previous variable. 
um, that's an older reordering option. There'll be a newer one that comes out in the next version of, uh, of uh, Met Plus. And then here is uh, specifying that output classification file for the forecast and the observations. And then uh, some of our plotting uh, output comes down here for the four plots. So in this case, you get uh, contour levels for the plots and output titles. And then uh, additionally, I didn't talk about this, but this is the directory where we're sending our matched pair output. So lastly, we get down to the uh, weather regime analysis script. So our this in this case, it's just being run once per lead, uh, but it'll just run once because it's a 24 hour time. And our two input files, OBS input and forecast input uh, listed here in the templates. In this case, we shouldn't need to change anything. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run this. Let's see. Oh, oops. The same way I would run uh, any other use case, but I'm going to call the script that's located in the MetBus directory, and then I'll call my tutorial uh, configuration file, and it should start up. Um, in this case, uh, this will take about three minutes to run. So I went ahead and just ran this last night so that we can take a look at some of the output uh, without waiting for it to run successfully. So um, I'm gonna go back to outputs, S2S. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the uh, uh, actually, I'll go up and take a look at the file list first in the staging area. So, in this case, I have my two input files so forecast input and, and OBS input, those contain my input files for the weather regime classification. They look exactly the same as they do for OMI, um, they're just pointing to different files. Um, then I will go up and take a look at some of the output. Um, so in the weather regime, uh, you get a lot more output than from the OMI. So NPR contains our matched pair files that are later used in stat analysis. And there's two directories in here. This, you know, you can specify this a different way if you want to in the output, but um, there's all of the matched pair files that come out. So you get one for each day. And, yes, oh, yeah. Sorry, somebody, somebody raised a hand. Do you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Maybe not. I, I don't see any hands up right now. Okay, so. I saw a hand up, but then maybe somebody accidentally clicked something. Okay, never mind. Sorry about that. Okay. No worries. Uh, we'll just we'll we'll go back to uh, weather regime. Um, so uh, here are so this one is that text classification file that comes out, and you get one for the forecast and the observation. So I'll go ahead and open it. So in this case, it's just year, month, day, and then whatever weather regime that particular day fell into. Uh, so that's the output text file. These two files are your multi-category contingency, contingency table statistics and your weather regime frequency uh, continuous statistics that come out of uh, the calls to stat analysis. Um, and so I'll go ahead and go into the plots directory. And then here are my plots. I mentioned there was four plotting options, but you get uh, one for the forecast and the observations. So eight of them actually come out in this case. Um, so I'll just go ahead and display one of them, make sure it looks okay, how it looks like. Uh, it's it's a little bit slow to pull up through VPN, so um, yeah, there it goes. 
hopefully. Um, doesn't, ah, here we go. Um, so these, you know, these plots are pretty big, but uh, this looks pretty much like uh, what we saw in the PowerPoint. So that's what uh, we're hoping for. Let's go back. Ah, and so MetPlus has successfully uh, finished running. So uh, the weather regime uh, worked. And then, um, uh, let's see, yeah, we have a couple of minutes left. I guess I could run uh, the blocking use case if anybody wants to see it, or if there's questions, we could just um, give time to answer, ask and answer questions. So does anybody have any questions uh, before I move on to that? Oh, um, there was a, a follow-up to that question about the weather regime applicable in the top tropics. Yeah, and, and the person asked um, if the 500 level can be changed, then the answer is yes. When you were yes. throwing out if that answered your question, yeah. Yes, uh, that is set to whatever you want it to be. Um, so I guess I said in the presentation it takes 500 millibar height, but that's what we've been testing it on. And you can really put in what, whatever variable you want in there to compute the weather regime analysis. All right, so, um, well, if there, if no more questions come in, I'll go ahead and just open uh, one of the blocking files so we can take a look at that before we go here. It's, which is in Met plus build base harm use cases, model applications, S2S. And we'll take a look at this blocking use case, which runs uh, forecast and observations. So um, there are those steps commented out. So much like the OMI use case, this use case has two calls to user script. The one of them is just populating a file list. In this case, we're, uh, we're calling that because the CBL climatology is computed over a different time frame from uh, what the uh, the IBLs and the blocking is computed over. So I have to pull those files separately. Um, so we'll go ahead and go, maybe we'll go ahead and go down. Okay, this is, this is moving extremely slow. Um, okay. So here are some of those user environment variable settings for the blocking. There's a lot more of these in this case. So you can see the smoothing points, which goes into the CBLs, the lat delta, and then uh, many of those parameters that control um, the, the timing and um, spatial settings for the blocking. And then here is our blocking user script command. So it just calls the blocking driver. Um, I could start this one up really fast, but it won't finish before uh, it takes, you know, four or five minutes. So it, it also won't finish before our session ends here. Um, so that was all I had planned to show. And it looks like we're right at time. Um, so is there, are there any final questions? All right, well, uh, if there aren't any questions, then I think we can um, we can uh, wrap up today's training. As a reminder, uh, two weeks from now, there is the Q&A. So if, uh, you know, if you get a chance to run these and you have questions, you can uh, ask, ask them then.